All right then, seniors. Uh, 7 a.m. I've been up since sort of 5.30, I guess earlier, with the baby. She's taking a nap now. Uh, so let's get into some checkoff, huh? Let's do this. Okay. So uh, remember we're reading A Trifle from Life by Chekhov. And this is for your first unit, which is on utilizing evidence. So uh, you, those of you who had me first semester uh, will recognize this as a little bit of a weaker Chekhov story, just as compared to Vanka and Sleepy, which are just masterpieces. This is a great story, but I also didn't want to use necessarily his strongest story uh, for this particular activity. You'll also notice that through all of that help page on Canvas, um, the Vanka example that I give you really interacts well with this text. You got a lot of common themes. Um, and most basically, both stories apply to children and children of very similar age. So that's why I chose this story. It's also very short. Um, you could complete assignment one without even reading the story. You could just hunt for evidence, but assignment two, I think, requires that you properly process the story. So it's up to you what kind of grade you want to get, and I'll work with you. Anyway, A Trifle from Life, Anton Chekhov. A well-fed, red-cheeked young man named uh, called Nikolai Ilyich Believ of 32, who was an owner of house property in Petersburg and a devotee of the race course, went one evening to see Olga Ivanovna Irnin, with whom he was living, or to use his own expression, was dragging out a long, wearisome romance. And indeed, the first interesting and enthusiastic pages of this romance had long been perused. Now the pages dragged on, and still dragged on, without presenting anything new or of interest. Not finding Olga Ivanovna at home, my hero lay down on the lounge chair and proceeded to wait for her in the drawing room. Good evening, Nikolai Ilyich, he heard a child's voice. Mother will be here directly. She's gone with Sonia to the dressmakers. Olga Ivanovna's son, Alyosha, a boy of eight, who looked graceful and very well cared for, who was dressed like a picture, in a black velvet jacket and long black stockings, was lying on the sofa in the same room. He was lying on a satin cushion and, evidently imitating an acrobat he had lately seen at the circus, stuck up in the air first one leg and then the other. When his elegant legs were exhausted, he brought his arms into play or jumped up impulsively and went on all fours, trying to stand with his legs in the air. All this he was doing with the utmost gravity, grasping and groaning painfully, as though he regretted that God had given him such a restless body. Ah, good evening, my boy, said Believ. It's you. I did not notice you. Is your mother well? Alyosha, taking hold of the tip of his left toe with his right hand and falling into the most unnatural attitude, turned over, jumped up, and peeped at Believ from behind the big fluffy lampshade. What shall I say, he said, shrugging his shoulders. In reality, mother's never well. You see, she is a woman, and women, Nikolai Ilyich, have always something the matter with them. Believ, having nothing better to do, began watching Alyosha's face. He'd never before, during the whole of his intimacy with Olga Ivanovna, paid any attention to the boy, and had completely ignored his existence. The boy had been born, or the boy had been before his eyes, but he had not cared to think why he was there and what part he was playing. In the twilight of the evening, Alyosha's face with his white forehead and black unblinking eyes unexpectedly reminded Believ of Olga as she had been during the first pages of their romance, and he felt disposed to be friendly to the boy. Come here, insect, he said. Let me have a closer look at you. The boy jumped off the sofa and skipped up to Believ. Well, began Nikolai Ilyich, putting a hand on the boy's thin shoulder. How are you getting on? How shall I say we used to get on a deal better, a great deal better? Why? It's very simple. Sonia and I used to only, only to learn music and reading, and now they give us French poetry to learn. Have you been shaved lately? Yes. Yes, I see you have. Your beard is shorter. Let me touch it. Does that hurt? No. Why is it that if you pull one hair, it hurts? But if you pull a lot all at once, it doesn't hurt a bit. Ah, 
and you know it's a pity you don't have whiskers. Here ought to be shaved, but here at the sides the hair ought to be left. The boy nestled up to Believ and began playing with his watch chain. When I go to the high school, he said, Mother is going to buy me a watch. I shall ask her to buy me a watch chain like this. What a locket. Father's got a locket like that. Only yours has little bars on it and has his letters. There's mother's portrait in the middle of his. Father has a different sort of chain now, not made with rings, but like ribbon. How do you know? Do you see your father? I, um, no, I, Alyosha blushed and in great confusion, feeling caught in a lie, began zealously scratching the locket with his nail. Believ looked steadily into his face and asked, Do you see your father? No. Come, speak frankly, on your honor. I see from your face you're telling a fib. Once you've let a thing slip out, it's no good wriggling about it. Tell me, do you see him? Come, as a friend. Alyosha hesitated. You won't tell mother, he said, as though I should. On your honor? On my honor. Do you swear? Oh, you provoking boy, boy what do you take me for? Alyosha looked round him, then with wide open eyes whispered to him, Only for goodness sake, don't tell mother. Don't tell anyone at all, for it is a secret. I hope to goodness mother won't find out, or we should all catch it. Sonia and I and Pelagea will listen. Sonia and I see father every Tuesday and Friday. When Pelagea takes us for a walk before dinner, we go to the Apfel restaurant, and there is father waiting for us. He's always sitting in a room apart, where you know there's a marble table and an ashtray in the shape of a goose without a back. What do you do there? Nothing. First we say, how do you do? Then we all sit around the table, and father treats us with coffee and pies. You know Sonia eats the meat pies, but I can't endure meat pies. I like the pies made of cabbage and eggs. We eat such a lot that we have to try hard to eat as much as we can at dinner, for fear mother should notice. What do you talk about? With father? About anything. He kisses us, he hugs us, tells us all sorts of amusing jokes. Do you know he says when we're grown up he's going to take us to live with him? Sonia doesn't want to go, but I agree. Of course, I should miss mother, but then I should write her letters. It's a queer idea, but we would come and visit her on holidays, couldn't we? Father says, too, that he will buy me a horse. He's an awfully kind man. I can't understand why Mother does not ask him to come and live with us, and why she forbids us to see him. You know he loves Mother very much. He's always asking us how she is and what she's doing. When she was ill, he clutched his head like this and kept running about. He always tells us to be obedient and respectful to her. Listen, is it true that we are unfortunate? Hmm. Why? Well, that's what Father says. You are unhappy children, he says. It's strange to hear him, really. You're unhappy, he says. I am unhappy, and mother's unhappy. You must pray to God, he says, for yourselves and for her. Alyosha let his eyes rest on a stuffed bird and sank into thought. So, growled Believ, so that's how you're going on. You arrange meetings at restaurants, and mother does not know. No. How should she know? Pelagea would not tell her for anything, you know. The day before yesterday, he gave us some pears, as sweet as jam. I ate too. Hmm. Well, and I say, listen, did father say anything about me? About you? What shall I say? Alyosha looked searchingly into Believ's face and shrugged his shoulders. He didn't say anything particular. For instance, what did he say? You won't be offended? What next? Why, does he abuse me? He doesn't abuse you, but you know he's angry with you. He says mother's unhappy owing to you, and that you've ruined mother. You know he's so queer. I explained to him that you're kind, that you never scold mother, but he only shakes his head. So he says I've ruined her. Yes, you mustn't be offended, Nikolai Ilyich. Believ got up, stood still a moment, and walked up and down the drawing room. That's strange and ridiculous. Ridiculous, he muttered, shrugging his shoulders and smiling sarcastically. He's entirely to blame, and I have ruined her, eh? An innocent lamb, I must say. So he told you I ruined your mother. Yes, but you said you would not be offended, you know. <laughs> I am not offended, and it's it's not your business. Why, it's, why, it's positively ridiculous. I've been thrust into it like a chicken in the broth. 
and now it seems I'm to blame. A ring was heard. The boy sprang up from his place and ran out. A minute later, he came in. Uh, a minute later, came into the room with a little girl. A lady came into the room with a little girl. This was Olga, Alyosha's mother. Alyosha followed them in, skipping and jumping, humming aloud and waving his hands. Eliev nodded and went on walking up and down. Of course, whose fault is it if not mine? He muttered with a snort. He's right. He is an injured husband. What are you talking about? Asked Olga. What about? Why well, just listen to the tales your lawful spouse is spreading now. It appears that I'm a scoundrel and a villain, that I've ruined you and the children. All of you are unhappy, and I'm the only happy one. Wonderfully, wonderfully happy. I don't understand, Nikolai. What's the matter? Why, well, listen to this young gentleman, said Believ, pointing to Alyosha. Alyosha flushed crimson, then turned pale, and his whole face began working with terror. Nikolai Ilyich, he said in a loud whisper. Shh. Olga Ivanovna looked in surprise at Alyosha, then at Believ, then at Alyosha again. Just ask him, Believ went on. Your Pelagea, like a regular fool, takes them about to restaurants and arranges meetings with their papa. That's not the point. The point is that their dear papa is a victim. While I'm a wretch who has broken up both your lives, Nikolai Ilyich moaned Alyosha, why you promised on your word of honor. Ah, get away, said Believ, waving him off. This is more important than any word of honor. It's the hypocrisy revolts me, the lying. I don't understand it, said Olga Ivanovna, and tears glistened in her eyes. Tell me, Alyosha, she turned to her son. Do you see your father? Alyosha did not hear her. He was looking with horror at Believ. It's impossible, said his mother. I will go and question Pelagea. Olga Ivanovna went out. I say, you promised on your word of honor, said Alyosha, trembling all over. Believ dismissed him with a wave of his hand and went on walking up and down. He was absorbed in his grievance and was oblivious of the boy's presence, as he had always been. He, a grown-up, serious person, had no thought to spare for boys. And Alyosha sat down in the corner and told Sonia with horror how he had been deceived. He was trembling, stammering, and crying. It was the first time in his life that he had been brought into such coarse contact with lying. Till then, he had not known that there are in the world, besides sweet pears, pies, and expensive watches, a great many things for which the language of children has no expression. I do love that story. The layers are coming through. Um, for your purposes, remember, you simply, for assignment one, have to prove to me that Alyosha is uh, an innocent child. Um, one thing you need to think about, I'll say this to you in the meeting if I get a chance, is you got to choose the best evidence also. I'm, I'm not handing out threes for if you just find the first two examples of evidence that kind of indicate he's innocent. There's too much power in this story, actually. So uh, if you want to do that, we can talk uh, strong PT maybe, but uh, I will be looking for examples of the strongest evidence that prove that uh, Alyosha is innocent. All right, treat yourself like a lawyer, damn it. Uh, get your client off. Prove his innocence. He's eight years old, and there's tons of evidence for his innocence. And then assignment two, I'm not going to talk to you about at all. I'm really curious to see what you guys do with Believ. All right, guys, let me know if you have questions. You've got to reach out to me, though. Have fun today.